disruptors and curious minds. Welcome to another episode of Thinking on Paper. My name's Jeremy. This is Mark. Hello. Each week, we get to talk to the founders, the builders, the creators that are architecting and building and hopefully delivering new versions of systems of the world that we will get to experience hopefully at one time in the near future. Um, we have a great guest today. We've been talking about quantum. It's been quantum season for a really long time. We are going to take it from this ethereal in the air discussion. We're going to pull it down. Like my grandfather used to say, land the damn plane, right? We're going to land the plane for a bit today, get a little tactical and figure out uh, how people are accessing quantum, what they're doing with it, and what uh, some folks like our guests, uh, what direction they're headed in. So, Mark, what do you got for me? Uh, our very special guest. Um, can I just say, if you listen to this, please like, subscribe, share, so we can get more incredible guests like we have today. We're teasing who we have today, but if you're interested in quantum, this is going to be it. Please join our book club as well. We're reading Nexus next. Um, currently reading Quantum Supremacy by Michu Kaku. So, um the the dunning kruger effect in full of steam we've learned some words we're dangerous we know some terminology but hopefully today's guest uh blake johnson quantum engine lead at ibm quantum is going to help us give a more tangible um use case of quantum and the main talking point today is going to be kiskit the sdk uh python framework for building and optimizing quantum circuits which for you and me, Jeremy, basically means it's going to be easier for classical computer developers to create code for quantum computers because um, there's no point having a spaceship if there's no one to fly it, and there's no point having incredible quantum computers if there's no software to run on it. So we're going to be learning about that. Um, what else? Um, the IBM roadmap from Heron and 132 qubits in 2024 to 2033, a thousand qubits and beyond. We're going to be talking about hopefully Watson X and AI using generative code developers in all of it, Jeremy. It's a big day. It's a big day. Let's bring, bring on our on guest, Dr. Blake. Blake Johnson. Hello. Welcome to hey, the show. Hey, how's it going, guys? It's going great. It's going great. We're we're glad you're here and we're we're excited because we want to we want to get a little bit more tangible with quantum. I think yeah, you know, we've we've laid some groundwork on, you know, just generally what quantum physics is from a wicked high level, right? What quantum computing is from a very, very high level. level, very high level. We're not, there's no whiteboards behind us. We're not doing any equations, but we want to take it, take it and get tangible and what your team is doing and what IBM is doing to make quantum computing accessible to researchers, to people that are trying to improve quantum computing. So maybe if you could just give us a short little background uh, of what you're involved with today and we can kind of go into some questions. Uh, my piece of the pie is, um, I mean, this thing that we call the quantum engine is basically the, the part of our, um, our software stack that's kind of responsible for actually executing a quantum, uh, quantum computing query on, uh, one of our quantum computers, um, either in our, our fleet that's in our uh, data center. Uh, we actually have two data centers, one now in New York and another, uh, that just opened in Germany, uh, or dedicated, uh, on-premises systems, uh, at various sort of partners and customer sites, uh, around the world. Uh, so, you know, when you, when you submit a query to a, a, a quantum computer, as you guys have just said, you have to construct a, a quantum circuit and some sort of question, of, uh, regarded to related to the output of your, of your computation. Um, but it's not yet in a form which actually executable in sort of the native, uh, language of, of, of the controller that, that, um, that operates the quantum computer. And so we have to package it up in, in the right way so that uh, it runs, uh, efficiently. And that gives you an answer that with, with, with hopefully the best sort of uh, performance and accuracy that we can. Got it. So we have, so we have these, IBM has these two data center facilities, quantum computing infrastructure in both of those that is accessible, uh, externally through the, through the cloud, I guess, correct. That people can kind of come into you have, tell us about this quantum computing network where you have some of these external organizations too, that are kind of in this giant quantum experiment together with you. Is that correct? That's right. So, I mean, as you said, like the quantum systems are uh, available uh, over the cloud. Uh, there's uh, sort of a free access plan that anyone can sign up for. Uh, and we've had lots of people sign up for it. I think uh, it's now over 600,000 people, if I have my number right. Um, and uh, so, I mean, it's 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 touched a lot of people already at this point. But can yeah, we, just, we've... Uh, yeah, so go on, ahead. On you, so 600,000 people have signed up to 
to use a quantum computer? So if I go and do this tomorrow, because now you've you've piqued my interest, what will I experience? And what will if, if companies watching this, what will they experience? Um, so uh, I mean the the experience uh, we've tried to make familiar, right? Like people are are already using a lot of uh, computing technologies uh, and cloud computing technologies, right? So whether or not they're computing locally on their laptops or uh, using some um, virtual machine uh, uh, on AWS, Azure, or IBM Cloud. We've tried to build an experience which is very much like that, right? So you have some sort of Python. Uh, we have a Python framework. We build uh, Qiskit, uh, which is a tool that that helps you in this process of constructing quantum circuits and packaging them up to to, to send to our service. Uh, but it, it feels, um, you know, the, the kinds of things you're constructing are novel and different. Um, but like the the experience is in, in somewhat we hope familiar. Uh, and we build a lot of content learning material that that helps you so that you're not, we're not just throwing you into the deep end, right? There's a we have uh, course material from sort of beginner uh, all the way up to sort of graduate student student level uh, uh, grad school level uh, material on quantum computing that can take you through this experience and also different modalities whether you like to watch YouTube videos or you like things which look more like a traditional textbook or problem examples uh, so there's really a wealth of resources. That's, and also to touch on too, I, I, we did a little bit of uh, background and research that you know there's the Python. Anyone who kind of understands Python or Rust on the other side, because I know there's some things you're you're doing incorporating some of the speed of Rust, but some of the ease of use of Python, right? To to kind of make this whole engine work. Is that the intent? Uh, so the. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, we've been in incorporating Rust into into the stack. Uh, so, uh, Qiskit is is our label for our entire software stack. And one of the topics I hope we can touch on uh, today is uh, the ways in which Qiskit has evolved and grown. But the kind of at the core of Qiskit is is our SDK, um, and that uh, is a project that we started in 2017 when we released the the 0 0.1 version of, of Qiskit. Um, and it started out as a pure Python library. Uh, and that choice of like Python was, you know, partly driven by the popularity of that as a programming language and particularly around, among, um, the audience we were trying to touch on, uh, first, right? Like, uh, our, our first audience were sort of other researchers, other people, physicists, computer scientists, quantum information theorists, uh, that had a background in quantum already, but wanted, uh, you know, to be able to touch hardware for the first time. Um, but the things that were kind of prized in that initial phase was uh, kind of the, you know, the flexibility and the adaptability, right? It was a tool for learning. Um, and while obviously we can't leave the flexibility and adaptability aside, we're still uh, learning is a hugely important part of the experiences. You get people familiar with a new paradigm, a different way of computing. Um, but at the same time, you know, we're no longer working with five qubit quantum computers. These are machines that uh, are capable of computations um, that we call sort of utility scale computations, which ones are that are not um, amenable to brute force classical simulation. We're now you know, comparing instead to alternative classical means of calculating uh, the response to some of, of some of some system. Um, so we're, we're not you're no longer uh, <laughs> you're no longer testing what happens by trying to simulate the quantum computer because you can't. Um, right, so it's it's this this new regime, uh, and so that the problems that we're working on are larger, right? Uh, and it's no longer sort of acceptable for the the tools we use to interact with the quantum computer to get in the way to prevent to present new barriers to doing useful work. Uh, and so that's what's caused us to to shift our attention to really sort of dig into the performance of of Qiskit itself and make sure that it it really excels. Uh, and so that's where we started this project uh, two and a half years ago now, almost three years, to kind of reinvent Qiskit from its core. You know, started out as a pure Python framework, but now to have it basically be a high-performance Rust core that maintains uh, the same Python interface to it. So our users uh, still interact with it the same ways, but they're interacting now with a much higher performance engine under the hood because it's uh, written in Rust. Is it useful for somebody like me or somebody like Jeremy or our audience to know what sort of 
problems you're solving or working through with this? Is that useful in any way to know that? Uh, in or is terms it of very the, abstract? In, in terms of the conversion of Qiskit to Rust? What you said, like, you, so you're, you're now modeling problems and, and working out problems that you can't do on a, with a classical simulation. Is it, is it useful to know what that might be like, that kind of problem? Uh, sure. Um, I mean, there's, uh, I mean, a lot of the problems that we're studying now um, have to do with uh, simulating physical systems, right? So uh, uh, we're looking a lot at condensed matter systems, at ch chemical systems, uh, where, um, uh, like spin glass systems, uh, where uh, we're trying to answer some, some questions about uh, how those systems uh, evolve in time. Um, so they're, they're, they're kind of dynamics, um, or you might ask, be asking questions about kind of like the spectrum, like the energy spectrum, the vibrational spectrum and so on of, of a chemical system. So spin class pertaining yes. to get dangerous, uh, Jeremy, <laughs> spin class pertaining to quarks. Is that where we're headed? Uh, or different. I mean, spin glasses appear throughout all condensed matter physics, uh, where we're talking about the behavior of, of solids and materials. Um, and you can get you can get rather uh, unusual uh, systems, ones that we don't uh, know actually exist in nature, uh, but that exist mathematically and that have even sort of more bizarre properties, right? And, and these are uh, the kinds of things that um, uh, people would, would love to study, but often, particularly in, in the realm of these synthetic materials, like you can't make them in the lab because they're kind of mathematical uh, abstractions or mathematical concepts. But now we can kind of create uh, miniature versions of them on a quantum computer and study and study their properties. Is um, that is that like a dark like a dark matter dark energy thing? Like we know it exists mathematically, but like no one's ever been like, oh, there it is over here, right? Is that what you're? <laughs> uh, that's an interesting analogy. Um, I mean, certainly like. Uh, so one of the things, which is, uh, I guess one similarity might be the fact that, you know, you can create a model of something of, of how it would work, how it should work mathematically, uh, but, and then have it kind of be able to study, uh, it's, it's properties kind of in practice. Um, and, and, uh, I'm not so in touch with, uh, the, the latest models that people are considering with dark energy and dark matter, but, um. No, it's okay. I, it's it's interesting to kind of see where these little tests are 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 going to be pointing everybody towards. You got what six hundred thousand people who have actually signed up to access uh, your quantum systems through Kiskit. And how is the what what's and that's over two years. The last two years. Uh, I mean, so the we launched the the first quantum uh, our first quantum computer on the cloud in twenty sixteen. Uh, so it's eight years ago now. Uh, so that's 600,000 uh, people that have joined in, in that period of time. Um, uh, but there's actually even larger audiences that we touched that haven't, uh, that are starting to learn, but haven't yet signed up to, to run their first circuit. So I think we've had over 9 million people uh, view, for instance, our, our digital learning content. Um, and we also have, um, uh, so we have this this large uh, audience that we can, can speak to. We also know uh, about 250 organizations that have joined our IBM Quantum Network, where those are sort of uh, enterprises, startups, uh, research institutions that are making sort of a, a more, a larger commitment. They're putting more resources in, in sort of um, uh, really become developing expertise uh, in how to, to take quantum computing into sort of the next, its, its next era. Yeah, I was thinking too, like a lot of the, a lot of, and you alluded to this a little bit uh, before talking about like chemical processes and natural processes that are kind of inherently quantum that we don't understand because we don't have the, the computing mechanism or we traditionally didn't have the computing mechanism to kind of process and understand that information. So let's say you have these researchers that are, you know, maybe chemists um, or, you know, focusing on, you know, proteins or something like that. Are you you're finding them kind of get interested, but they don't have necessarily quantum computing or computer science knowledge, right? So, exactly. how are you bridging that gap in this whole thing? Uh, so that's, I mean, that's really important, right? Like the, um, the, the, you know, if the first phase of quantum computing was about, you know, uh, learning about the technology itself, like letting people answer about 
you know, how does quantum mechanics work, you know, in practice or uh, what are qubits, what is entanglement, what is superposition, these kind of basic properties that we're, we're, we're harnessing to do a new kind of computing. Um, the kind of the the next phase, uh, you know, sort of in that same phase, we were really focused then on kind of the fundamental performance of 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 the hardware systems themselves, right? Uh, because quantum information is inherently more fragile than quantum than classical information, right? Like if you think about error rates of a classical computer, uh, you maybe observe uh, an error rate sort of in one out of ten to the fifteen or even ten to the eighteen operations. Um, which are kind of scales which are so low that it's only in sort of the, the largest uh, classical computer systems that you even observe, you know, a few errors per day. Whereas even in a high performance quantum computing system, error rates might be sort of uh, one in, a, in, a, in every thousand uh, operations that you have an error. So like protecting information uh, and sort of coping with errors in, in quantum computing systems is a much more uh, prevalent. It's it's a much more uh, larger part of, of the process of building a high performing quantum system is is sort of dealing with these errors um, through various technologies. And so, like even today, like a large part of our efforts are focused on driving down the physical error rates and then developing methods, error mitigation methods, and eventually error correction methods uh, that can can squeeze more performance out of uh, uh, out of out of the quantum hardware. But uh, as we start to then uh, sort of get to a, a space where the system can actually do computations, which are relevant to a, a more traditional um, uh, a computational scientist, someone that you know is used to studying chemicals, used to studying higher energy physics problems, is used to studying uh, material systems, using high performance, traditional high performance computing as their tool for which they do those, you know, they enable those investigations. Like you, like you say that. that you know, we want to, to make quantum computing uh, impactful to them using terminology that they already know, right? So like we're uh, actively trying to engage in sort of this, this next phase of, of trying to, you know, capture the interest and actually deliver value to computational scientists, trying to deliver tools that, um, that are kind of native to their, their domains. Uh, we really uh, are not, we're trying to do it, we're not trying to do it alone. We're really trying to engage a community in building up uh, these new tools. So something. I mean, I think, go ahead. No, no. I, I, I th it was open source, and the, the the more we learn about quantum computing, the more we learn about the importance of the software and how it has to be designed for classical developers, because there simply isn't that deep knowledge in enough minds to execute to create these <laughs> quantum circuits so that has to be done I, I i just i wonder so from what you've been speaking if we could pan out onto the the ibm roadmap that leads from where you are now to 2033 and then beyond a thousand qubits um where does kiskit fit into the roadmap and how you mentioned earlier you wanted to speak about the evolution of it H how is it evolving in sync with the roadmap and how how do you foresee the next like is it q kit q kiskit two next year you expect to come out is, is everything on track and how's it evolving uh interesting question so um in some ways kiskit is kind of uh um one of the foundational technologies that enables the entire roadmap right but kind of kiskit our, we view our hardware and software stack uh, as a co-design problem um, to to power the sort of the rest of the developments uh, in terms of an ecosystem that builds on top of this kind of foundational technology. Um, and so, like I said, you know, having entered now the, the era of utility in quantum computing, uh, we, we uh, sort of spurred our development in terms of the performance of Qiskit itself. But then, um, you know, uh, what Qiskit uh, and its related technologies have to do uh, to enable uh, larger and larger computations and to enable computations in different problem domains, it, it has to evolve. So um, one of the things that we've been doing now is in a um, is in a, uh, a part of the Qiskit stack called the Qiskit Runtime, which is a uh, a layer that is uh, uh, really part of the quantum computer itself. It, it kind of it, it's uh, 
maybe if you if you like, it's part of like the operating system um, that manages. It, uh, one of its critical functions is to to manage uh, the presence of errors by um, by technologies by error mitigation technologies. And these are ones that execute uh, not single circuits, but collections uh, of related circuits, uh, and then introduces post-processing uh, from the outcome of the of executing uh, that large fam larger family of circuits to get uh, uh, an answer which is more accurate than uh, than executing you know, single circuits on their own. So it allows us to get more performance, more accuracy out of our computations by sort of uh, by looking at the behavior of, of a larger families of circuits where we can kind of uh, manipulate uh, quantum noise uh, to, to figure it to, to basically emulate the performance of a, of a, of a quantum computer that had fewer errors. Um, so that's an important technology that we're, we're doing, we're, uh, we've been developing and, and, and releasing in the, in the last uh, two years. Um, and, and that's a technology which will continue to evolve together with our hardware um, uh, towards uh, larger uh, enabling users to kind of confidently execute circuits of a larger and larger size. So this year, our, our, our goal was to deliver circuits with up to 5,000 two qubit gates as a reliable computational tool. And leading up to uh, 2028, uh, we will be continuing to drive combinations of improvements in the hardware and the software in this, in this kind of Qiskit runtime uh, uh, technology that enable computations up to uh, 15,000 gates. Um, but after that, uh, we intend to take a, a real step change uh, in 2029 to an error-corrected technology stack, um, which will um, use a different method for managing errors. Uh, we're really using, instead of encoding information in uh, or trying to deal with errors by running large collections of circuits uh, and, and post-processing uh, the outcome to emulate the effect of lower errors kind of after the fact. Uh, in error correction, you instead encode information redundantly in multiple physical qubits uh, and use real-time uh, detection and correction uh, of of errors as they occur, just to uh, suppress the presence of errors sort of in each execution. And these technologies aren't mutually exclusive; they can work together, uh, uh, which we think may be an important part of how we sort of bridge uh, between an, a, a realm of error mitigation and error correction. But that error correction uh, technology is is we anticipate being extremely powerful because it will allow us to go from circuits of like fifteen thousand two qubit gates to circuits of of a hundred million uh, two qubit gates in twenty twenty nine, and we anticipate even going uh, uh, even further beyond that with our, our ultimate goal in twenty twenty three to be able to execute uh, circuits with a billion um, two qubit gates. Could so, you just wow. simplify yeah. that? That those numbers and, and those gates, what what for a layman, what does that mean? Going jumping to that many million gates on a um so the I mean it, here's where if we had a picture it would help us a little bit. Um but the the, the different applications, there are, there are people that have had made uh, various estimates of how large of a circuit you need to be able to, to execute in order to encode problems in different application domains, whether they're uh, chemistry, uh, material science, uh, biology and health, life sciences, uh, optimization, uh, right? There's uh, or even sort of, you know, cryptographically relevant problem scales, right? And uh, for all of these problems, uh, you know, our answers that we come to up to with now are based on sort of our current knowledge of, of, of algorithms. And, and so, uh, you know, there's multiple algorithms that are relevant for each of these, but, you know, they kind of put you in some space of sort of width and depth of the representation when, when written as a quantum circuit, which in, in sort of more traditional computer technology terminology is like uh, memory and time, right? Like, uh, it's like, how much space uh, do I need? But it's quantum space rather than classical space to, to write down my problem. Um, you know how big of a memory do I need on my on my computer, and and time is is you know equivalent to sort of how many operations and I and I uh, uh, execute with that with that amount of space, um, and so uh, 
when we're talking about circuits, you know, uh, you know, current knowledge would suggest that you need to get out to um, this kind of hundred million or even billion uh, scale uh, to finally uh, have sort of definitive uh, advantage over the best known classical algorithms. Uh, but that landscape um, is largely, in, you know, I would say today is informed by by theory. We have sort of mathematics. We can we can do proofs of you know. I compare this mathematical thing with that mathematical thing, and I can tell you that this sort of gap exists. Uh, but the early history of classical computing wasn't driven by proofs. It was driven by practice, by empiricism, by people sort of developing algorithms um, because they worked and they were effective in practice, not because they could prove you know, their computational complexity compared to others. Um, kind of a little analogy to like Newtonian versus quantum physics, right? Like very first one is very more concrete proven. It's the way it is. And this is more trust us. It's the most proven <laughs> theorem of all time. Just trust us. Right. Um, <laughs> hmm. Yes. Um, maybe uh, the, I mean, I, I would say that's a little unfair to quantum theory in the sense that people had very, uh, very concrete reasons uh, for, uh, for quantum theory, particularly in terms of uh, kind of thinking about the world as uh, in kind of a probabilistic sense, or you know, the the, the knowledge that I can possibly have as an observer, um, and uh, I think a, a a really sort of statistical sort of Bayesian like approach to the world kind of naturally leads to a, a kind of a quantum description. Um, but I, I guess maybe the example I was trying to think of more in reference to the early history of, of classical computing, right, is like people were doing all kinds of things uh, that were practically useful with like sorting algorithms, for instance. Uh, quick sort is uh, one of the most predominant uh, sorting mechanisms uh, that we know today, and it's, it has fantastic performance. Um, but uh, people were, were using it because it was good before they could prove that it uh, was uh, was effective because they we actually needed to d develop a new uh, mathematical trick, a new mathematical idea in order to, to understand the difference between worst case complexity and average case complexity. Um, and without this sort of mathemat this new mathematical framework, we couldn't prove uh, that the, the that quick sort was a was a good uh, sorting algorithm. So um, what my my point is really that what we know about algorithms today is is about uh, is a little bit of a reflection in my view of of our kind of our state of uh, mathematical proof apparatus. Um, and uh, what I'm very excited about is you know um, we've, there's, there's kind of two boundaries we know about the kind of the, the limits of like, if you give me an ideal quantum computer, what could I do with it? Uh, and we can tell you certain boundaries there of like what it could do. And then we have the, 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 the other limit of how large does a quantum computer need to be before I can stop really simulating it. And right now the, the state of the world is like, we've, we've passed this first boundary, uh, where you can. You can today go sign up on an IBM quantum computer and, and execute cal cal computations uh, that uh, would take you an um, extraordinary amount of expertise to find an alternative means because you can't do it by brute force, uh, a way to simulate its, out its outcome, its output. Uh, so we now have, we've entered this re realm where there's this chasm between where we know how big the system needs to be to do something provably better and the, 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 the regime where I could simulate its, out, its output. Uh, there are some people that believe that there's nothing in this chasm. I think these people are crazy. I, 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 can't, I can't accept the fact that nature admits such a large gap to exist. And so what, what I think is going to happen is that we, uh, by enabling this sort of new era of uh, empirical study of exploration, uh, with tools that kind of are native to different computational scientists, that uh, the the kind of the our current worldview of algorithms will will change dramatically, um, and so that's I think what makes it really critical then to to embark on this journey of making tools that that are um, easy to consume, but from from different uh, uh, sort of computational domains. Makes sense. I want to go back a little bit to the to the increase in the quantum gates, right? As we as we project out to potentially a billion or whatever, is in, in 
forgive my ignorance, this may be a really silly question, but like, is the the nature of quantum, like, as I think about things like, you know, path integral, right? So you you model all the paths and find the best one. Super simple explanation of that, I'm sure. But is that, is it to have enough of these paths that you can really analyze all of these things? Does that have anything to do with it or am I off the mark on that one? Um, so, I mean, the, the space aspect, the, the sort of the width of the circuits is maybe the easier piece to, to kind of intuitively grasp, right? I, I sort of need enough quantum memory to encode my problem. Um, and exactly how much memory you need depends on how you encode, um, right? There are maybe simple encodings that use up a lot more space than more complex encodings that can be denser. Uh, but sort of the the size in terms of number of qubits I need, um, really I can I can, I can I can at least needs to be proportional to the problem the size of the problem I'm trying to solve. Um, in terms of the depth of the circuit that you need, uh, yeah, maybe thinking about it in terms of of, of your analogy is is appropriate. Like, um, uh, I mean, again, there's going to be some some factors which are related to uh, things which are, uh, less de problem de dependent and more like, uh, statements about the hardware. Like maybe I need, uh, two, two bits of quantum memory that are far apart physically on the machine to interact. And maybe that takes some amount of computation to get them to connect, but really it's kind of the overall scaling of the depth has to do with something about, um, uh, sort of how many operations I need in order to sort of encode the evolution of, of the quantum state. Um, and so, yes, that's going to be related to, uh, for instance, in, in the domain of like simulating nature, it's going to be related to sort of, um, it could be directly related to, for instance, uh, uh, the amount of time that I want to capture in my simulation. Uh, if I'm trying to capture very short times, maybe that's a, a lower depth computation. And if it's a longer time, um, maybe it's a longer computation. And if I'm trying to capture like the properties of a material that depend on interactions between things that are far apart, then I need to sort of naturally have some sort of encoding where enough time evolves uh, to 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 capture the interaction that leads to the behavior that that uh, that I want to study. Uh, so uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe that's the the best we can do for now in terms of like an intuitive picture. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Thanks for the clarity. That's great. Well, uh, can I? Uh, I have another one then on the on the, the amount of qubits and the error correction. And this is we're going to demonstrate. We've read too many books here, and one of the things we've learned is th the increasing amount of qubits gives you more qubits that you can use for the error correction. But we've read about different types of quantum computers, so I'm not sure now in the IBM world if that still if that applies to what you're doing. So if you have a, a million qubits and you can use 950,000 of them for the error correction and you only need to, like, like, can you help me make this work in my head um so absolutely yeah there's a lot of different error correcting codes with very different properties uh, and particularly with respect to how efficiently they encode information so the um Maybe the predominant paradigm that has existed in, in the quantum computing field for the last couple of decades, uh, there's been an extraordinary amount of effort studying something known as the surface code. And the surface code has some beautiful properties in terms of like the constraints it requires the system builder to satisfy. Uh, you need error rates that are somewhat uh, achievable. You only need uh, sort of local connectivity. Qubits only need to be able to... to to have operations with neighboring qubits, uh, things like this that, that lead to some practical uh, benefits in terms of being able to realize error correction. The problem with the surface code, though, is that it's very inefficient in terms of uh, information encoding. Um, in fact, um, uh, the, you, you, um, you need just an extraordinary number of qubits in order to achieve uh, computationally relevant error rates. And so uh, that's led um, to effort to find something better. And recently, our team um, has found a, a new family of error correcting codes that are uh, um, they're a, a kind of low-density parity check code, which is uh, 
LDPC codes also exist in sort of classical communications uh, theory as well. Uh, but these these codes um, uh, have some properties which are very attractive, and in particular, they're much more efficient in terms of their encoding density. Um, so, uh, our the, the IBM development plan is is based off of uh, realizing systems with these. Um, uh, LDPC uh, codes, and we uh, we believe that we can do so with uh, 14 times fewer physical qubits than uh, you would need in, a, in an equivalent system that's based off of a surface code. And, and finding an order of magnitude is, is huge in terms of uh, the engineering practicalities of, of how long it will take us to, to build such systems. Okay, thanks. I was hoping we could return for a bit to some of the things we're building to um, uh, to make the, these systems accessible to other audiences. Yes, please. Uh, we touched on it at the very beginning. Uh, our, our, the new pieces involving Watson X and generative AI, uh, and that, I think that's a, one piece of this that is is particularly cool uh, and and also brand new. Um, Right, like IBM has uh, put an enormous effort um, into, into into building um, uh, up a, a genre of AI technology stack uh, based on open source models uh, known as Granite. Um, and uh, in partnership with the Watson X team, uh, we recently uh, uh, have created a version a version of of the Granite model that has been particularly trained on Qiskit. Um, and so. Uh, this is really cool because you now have a tool that can kind of exist within uh, in your development environment, something called the Qiskit Code Assistant. Uh, it has like a, a VS Code extension, or you can, if you like Jupyter Labs, um, Jupyter Notebooks, uh, there's a plugin for that too. Uh, but it allows you to sort of, you know, without leaving your development environment, um, uh, use this uh, powerful LLM to, uh, to help you uh, write Qiskit Code. Um, and it's been particularly... Uh, trained on a corpus of of modern examples, uh, so it uh, which is great because Qiskit is, has has evolved a lot in in its uh, uh, seven years of life, and and so it uh, can be more accurate, uh, for instance, than than finding a a five year old answer on Stack Overflow. Um, but we, we we hope this kind of uh, particularly helps the beginner uh, start to engage uh, with the tools and, and start to get started faster. Um, a second thing, which is an entirely different kind of technology altogether and a very different strategy, um, is that we're starting to build tools with partners, uh, that, uh, instead of operating at the, the, the language of circuits operate at the, the, the language of, of the problems in their domain. So there's, um, two in particular that have been released in something we call our Qiskit functions catalog. Um. There's one from uh, QControl, which is an optimization function, and one from Qunisys, which is a, a chemistry uh, function. And in both of these, uh, uh, both of these new tools developed by partners on top of the IBM stack, uh, you really give it a problem description that has nothing to do with quantum computing at all. <laughs> right. In the optimization case, from for instance, from QControl, you give it a description of your optimization problem, and it gives you back a solution. And nowhere in that process do you see a quantum circuit. Uh, and uh, even better, it works. <laughs> um, and uh, and so, like, uh, I think this is really powerful in terms of like finally being able to touch um, new audiences with with tools that kind of are, are native uh, to the, the kind of the way that they're used to to, to thinking about problems. I love that kind of qu quantum solutions, but without the the complexity of the interacting with the the quantum hardware. Yes. So in these in this function library is it's kind of split into I think the first one is probably like a circuit function, right? And the second one is more application function. Um the Quantisys one, I guess. So that would be like a researcher could come in who's who's doing ground state problem work with molecules and kind of just jump in and start to figure out how some of this stuff works. Is that the intention? Yeah, I mean, uh, what Qunis has done is really cool. I mean, one of the kind of new frontiers in terms of uh, enabling us to tackle larger and larger problems is finding new ways to kind of blend uh, quantum computing and classical computing, right? I think we people used to 
think of these sort of in contention or really competition, right? Like I was just had my quantum computer adjust my classical computer, but I think it's become more and more obvious to us uh, over time that uh, these technologies really ought to be used together uh, and that they're more, um, they, they, they really complement each other and kind of, um, uh, we can find ways to augment the capabilities of, of both when we use them to, uh, in concert with each other. Um, so in particular with, uh, with QNSYS, uh, what they've built is a technique which can um, uh, uh, take the problem of computing uh, properties of like ground states of, of, of molecules and um, they, they, they run some, uh, they, they execute some circuits representing uh, something about the configuration of, of that system. Um, and they'll get back answers that have errors but they can uh, use, uh, uh, but because they have access to this, uh, this quant these quantum samples from something which is closer uh, to, to the right answer, they can use a, a more efficient classical technique to then refine those answers and get a, a better final outcome. So they're really using kind of something which is like traditional HPC-like computation, really in concert with the outcomes of, of a quantum computer to jointly solve uh, a chemistry problem better than than you could with just the quantum machine on its own. Um, and, uh, and, you know, in this problem of like whether or not there can do better than what you can do with just a, a classical machine on its own is uh, kind of we're in the thick of, of sort of answering that question. But I think we're very close and that's really exciting. Yeah. And I, and I love what you said about these these two working together. It's not like, you know, it's not like you have one camp that's like quantum or bust and then other camp is classical or bust and we're like we're going to go separate it's kind of like let's work together but there is i think theoretically going to be some point where where quantum's going to be like all right we got this figured out it's time to move on and and move to this next phase of computing like how far out is that if you i mean i'm not going to hold you to anything but like is that is that 10 years is that 15 years like in terms of like when we'll have uh applications of quantum computing where there's like unequivocal quantum unequivocally the best uh solution um i mean i think i'm even more optimistic i would say probably in the next uh five or six years we will we'll go to that phase uh you know that's speculative but uh i i, I, I I'm, that's that's where i sit it might, uh, more, I, it might be a more interesting question on that is so it's 2033 what's driving ibm now and what will you be able to do if you execute on this roadmap which is another question is like the roadmap see like i've seen a lot of roadmaps in the past and they never ever seem to follow the steps but the ibm one seems to be very well thought out i'm not sure how you've managed that but 2033 <laughs> what 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 will you be doing what will people be doing where where should we be thinking about the application, the real world application to change lives and save life in 2033 with this? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, so as I think we've, we've talked about, right, like the way that we think about the power of these machines is really in terms of the size of the circuits they, they can execute reliably. Um, and we just, uh, I think it's, it's pretty safe to say that uh, whatever applications there are, we're, we're simply, um, opening up the aperture uh, to to more and more applications as the size of circuits we can reliably execute gets bigger. By the time we get to 2020, 2033 uh, and our BlueJay systems executing uh, circuits with a billion, uh, billion gates, um, I, I think we're, you know, we're touching even the, the, the points where we, uh, we know that applications exist. Um, and so, uh, particularly in in um, in, uh, in material science, um, and and the other areas of application, whether they're chemistry, optimization, and so on, um, you know, uh, we don't know yet. But uh, I th we have a lot of time to sort of bring uh, um, to to improve algorithms in all those spaces because I think it's. Uh, I have a hard time believing that that there won't be major advances in those domains as well, particularly because like the state of the art in terms of optimization, right, is that uh, the um, you know the gate model quantum computers 
are now sort of the best uh, quantum uh, devices for for solving optimization problems. They're even better than the, the, the machines that were sort of specific special purpose machines built for optimization. Um, and okay, they're not yet at the point of, of beating the best known classical methods, uh, but you have to have find, you have to actually work really, really hard classically to, to outperform them. Um, and uh, so like if we're already there today, like, uh, I don't know. I think it's it's kind of crazy to think that you know we the systems can improve by uh, another uh, seven eight orders of magnitude, and and I won't I won't uh, <laughs> have found advantage. So like the um, I, I I really you know the how broad the scope is. I guess only time will tell. But um, my hope is that by the time we're talking. In, about Blue Jay in 2033, we'll really reach an era where the applicability of quantum computing is is broad um, and and easy to find, um, so that um, it's really starting to impact most problem most uh, most domains where the kind of the fundamental uh, difficulty of the problem is has to do with the fact that we're trying to simulate nature or trying to to um, we're dependent upon. Um, um, problems that have structured data uh, where which are the kind of the fundamental properties where there's really good evidence that quantum computers should basically be the best tools for, for solving those problems. Blake, this this has been an, an amazing chat. I, I think we've definitely succeeded in getting getting tangible on 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 some of the things and what you guys are doing with over six six hundred thousand people locking in and testing and playing around with with quantum computing and then also the I think you said like 9 million people investigating and trying to get up to speed through your learning platforms on, on quantum. Like as we move through these, through these phases, you're, you're bringing in the community, you're activating the community. I think it's, I think it's doing some really cool things. I've got, I've got two things that uh, I got one thought experiment that I always like to throw out there. And then we've got a final question. We always like to ask our guests to leave a question for our next guest. And it can be out about any topic. It doesn't have to be quantum. It doesn't have to be computing. It can be literally anything. So let me hit you with this thought experiment first. So we talked about, you know, a lot of, a lot of systems in nature are, are quantum mechanical. Uh, Mark and I've been geeking out about photosynthesis. We've been, you know, geeking out about a, a, a nitrogen of, fixing, nitrogen fixing, like all of these things that that nature does really well, and nature does quantum processes like at room temperature, right? And we're trying to do quantum processes in very controlled environments. I always like to think like, you know, bits are easy to deal with, right? But like you have qubits, they're a little harder to wrangle and a little more finicky, right? So, is there going to be a point you think where we could potentially? Or could there be a point where we potentially unlock a secret of nature that could inform how we design quantum computers? It certainly seems possible. Um, I mean, the in fact, I would even say probable, right? Like the one of the kind of fundamental tensions you find among practitioners uh, or system builders, right? Like. Uh, I think is you're, you're probably well aware that people um, choose vastly different quantum systems uh, to build quantum computers, and they're all successful um, in different ways. But the these fundamental, the kind of the fundamental components we're using uh, start out with very different ingredients, right? From people that are using kind of natural uh, quantum systems, things which are that look like a single atom or a single ion. Um, to uh, on sort of on one extreme to those of us that use kind of synthetic quantum systems where we are building you know in, in the ibm quantum computers that they're kind of their heart our qubits are based off of superconducting quantum circuits that have an energy spectrum which is like an atomic energy spectrum so we have kind of we talk about artificial atoms as being kind of the constituent components um and you know the these two different realms have different uh, trade offs, right? The the the, the natural ions. Uh, nature makes uh, uh, quantum systems with uh, with when you pick the right one that have extraordinary coherence properties, meaning that the quantum formation is very long lived and very well protected on those uh, these quantum systems. Um, but part of the reason that, that they that they uh, the sort of the natural uh, qubits are so good is that their interactions with the outside external world are very weak, 
right? So uh, that means that the, the kind of the operation rates on these natural qubits are very slow. Um, whereas with the, the engineered systems like superconducting circuits, um, if you uh, if you don't take great care in their construction, um, the actually their interaction rates with the external world are very strong, and that leads to very poor coherence properties. So that the the rate with the so they sort of decohere very very quickly. Um, and of course, like the ideal quantum system would be the one that sort of blends the properties of the two, right? Where you have kind of the lifetimes, the coherence times uh, of the natural systems with the operation rates of, of the synthetic ones. Um, and so maybe there's something still to, to be to be learned from nature about how to uh, sort of get access to just the, those sort of neural channels that we need to communicate with uh, quantum systems, but that still preserve uh, the remarkable coherence properties that you can find in nature. That's why this stuff is so exciting. Like the, the, the potential of, of this is just, has my mind spinning in, in really fun ways. Blake, we appreciate you coming on and talking about what you guys are doing. Um, I, I love I love the accessibility component that you guys are building in with your SDK, with with getting people educated, with pulling people into this quantum network that shares learnings and third-party people are building applications for for chemists to figure out ground state molecule stuff. I think it's I think it's awesome and amazing. Um what question would you have uh, to leave for our guests? And our guests are, are all over the place. I mean, quantum, they're in AI. Some of them are creators. Some of them are writers. Some of them are ethicists. Like, I think it'll be like uh, just our next guest will be uh, working in crypto and blockchain. So if there's a, Ooh, yeah. a link there. Crypto and blockchain. Um, hmm. I, I guess I would say, uh, uh, you know, I guess I'm curious to see what uh, an expert in crypto and blockchain, um, they, when they believe that quantum computers will impact their field. And if they had a, uh, you know, a Blue Jay scale quantum computer, uh, what would they do with it? Should Ooh, I? Keys to the Blue Jay. I love should it. Should they be worried? Should 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 our next guest should I should I, we we spoke to the IBM quantum team the other day and you should be worried working in crypto or is there nothing to worry about? Um, I mean, briefly we can touch on that, right? Like our team is uh, so even a Blue Jay scale quantum computer is uh, not sufficiently large to break current day uh, public key crypto systems. Uh, you need to be even larger. Um, it gets close. Um, and uh, but you know, you know we're not going into this blind, and our team has also been at IBM has also been at the forefront of developing so-called post-quantum um, uh, cryptography methods. Uh, in fact, uh, IBM participated in the development with partners of of the both of the protocols that have been selected by NIST as the new standards for um, uh, post-quantum cryptography and are the, the, the new recommendations for enterprises to uh, to use to ensure that uh, that our information stays secure in, a, in a, a world where quantum computers of cryptographically relevant sizes exist. Um, so, um, so yeah, you don't have to worry even at the, the extent of IBM's roadmap. Um, but uh, I mean, I would also say like, particularly for enterprises that, uh, that deal with um, sensitive information, banks, healthcare systems, and so on. Um, learning about the new crypto, new cryptography methods, um, now is the time, right? Uh, because uh, transitioning those systems can be slow and painful, but uh, we actually have um, tooling that can already help you make that transition. And so it's uh, not too, too early to sort of get a handle of the cryptography used in your enterprise and, and figure out uh, your transition plan. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I've got one observation and one question. So my observation is that there's not enough highly skilled computer developers in the world. Every time we have a guest on, if it's, they're in a blockchain, it's like there's a shortage of people who can do this. If we work in robotics, there's a shortage of people who can do this. Now it's quantum. There's a shortage of people who can do this. And we're making these systems, IBM, you're doing, you're making these systems to try to make it easier so that you don't need to have that 
works maybe and maybe with ai you don't need to have that level so you can combine the two i think that's very interesting and i'm going to keep thinking about that and my one question is osprey flamingo kookaburra heron starling who's the ornithologist what's with the birds <laughs> Uh, we have I have several colleagues that are uh, uh, really into birds. Um, I, I, but the I guess the final say, particularly in terms of the the, the latest round of birds, uh, is uh, Jake and Bedam, um, who who particularly insisted in, in sort of that the latest update of our of our roadmap had some Australian birds because he's from Australia. Um, so uh, kookaburra in particular, you know. I, I really enjoyed the, the the Starling in there because Starling points back to a, a program called Boyd's back in the 1980s, I think, which was a software development program that tried to map how Starlings were random because okay. they fly in these like, so there's basically one Starling that makes a move to the left and then all the Starlings around it make that additional move to the left. And that's why the whole pack moves and swirls in all these di different ways. So I, I, I grabbed on the Starling. I was like, hey, that's cool, right? That sounds wow. like a complex quantum system there, Jeremy. <laughs> there it is. There it is. Well, this has been a great chat, Blake. Thanks for uh, entertaining our uh, our organized and our not in our ethereal questions. I know we threw a couple at you. We appreciate you running with all that. That's and uh, Mark will put a great uh, show right up together for this with some links of what you guys are doing. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us. Um, and Mark, closing thoughts before we get out of here. Join our book club, like and subscribe to Thinking on Paper so that we can continue having conversations like this and try and join the dots of emerging technologies. And yeah, thank you for, I think we're quantum addicts, Jeremy. I think maybe we need to, <laughs> to do something about it. We need to go to Germany. I can go to Germany and look at the new center. Is it open to the public? uh i don't think so i mean uh these systems right like we don't want just anyone coming <laughs> we, don't want, we, won't, we don't want the qubits to decohere when you when you show up mark we, that's the reason why you can't go um uh, I, I think i do understand that the our partner the partners at cleveland clinic actually have their on-premises system in their cafeteria so maybe if you uh have any friends that are researchers at the cleveland clinic you can uh, go walk by Amazing. Well, thanks again for joining. Uh, those of us still listening, thinking on paper.xyz. Be curious, stay disruptive. Keep thinking on paper. See you next week. Next time.